just before I get started, how many of you guys are um, working with shelters that are already doing transport programs? Okay, um, and how about, how, how many of you are the source shelter? So you guys are the ones sending dogs or cats? Okay, just a couple, the rest must be receiving. So the lecture is geared towards both of those types of um, shelters that are participating. So um, again, hopefully you'll get some good advice as we go through today. Um, so you, you guys know, of course, the shelter transport programs are where we're literally moving one or more animals from one shelter to another. And this is happening on a local basis. It might be you're moving um, dogs or cats from, your na from a neighboring shelter to your shelter within the same city or the same state. It's also happening regionally throughout the United States where we're moving animals from one part of the US to another. And then also internationally as well. And that's typically where animals are moving from underserved countries into the US or when there's natural disasters, um, they, their transport programs may be bringing them into the United States. But probably what's more important to realize with transport programs is that when you enter into a program, you're actually forming a really important collaboration be between the source and the destination shelter. And this is how we are going to be um, saving lives of animals that are at risk for euthanasia. Um, we also, by doing this, we're also hopefully supporting the source shelter and maybe even helping to resolve some of the problems that are contributing to overpopulation in their shelter and in their community. And then lastly, we're hopefully going to meet the needs of the destination sh shelter. So if you're a destination shelter, you're probably wanting to do transport so you're bringing animals in because you don't have uh, you don't feel like you have enough of a certain type of animal, and hopefully the transport program will help you to do that. So source shelters, typically these are shelters that are going to have higher intake rates than the destination shelter would. Um, they are often operating at capacity and at times over capacity. They usually have less resources available, whether that's less financial resources or staff resources. In some cases, it's the resource of the building or facility itself. They literally don't have room to house any more animals than what they already have. And they usually have higher euthanasia rates, and that may be that they are actually having to euthanize just for space at, at certain times of the year, or maybe regularly, where the destination shelter should or usually has lower intake um, and it should for sure have lower intake and room to bring these animals in at the time of transport. So they usually are operating below capacity. And again, that should definitely be happening when you're trying to bring um, a transport into the destination shelter. They usually have more resources available, so more financial resources, um, more space to house these animals, more staff than uh, source shelters typically do. And therefore, they have lower euthanasia rates. As a uh, matter of fact, they should not be having to euthanize for space um, and for destination shelters. So why would transports make us nervous or at least make us pause before we go jumping into them? Or may, and for many of you, you're already involved in transport programs and so you may be experiencing some stressors already. But the reason, uh, there's a whole bunch of reasons why we should really think about these programs. The first is there is potential for spread of infectious diseases. And this picture here, you, uh, if, I don't know how well you can see it. It's a bunch of crates. There's about 50 of them that are lined up and piled up and they're um, getting ready to load them onto an airplane for a transport program. And you can see those crates, the animals are real close together. It's possible that they could be even be put in facing nose to nose together. So there's potential for infectious diseases to spread on transport vehicles, but also into your shelter. You could absolutely bring something in if you're a destination shelter that you didn't intend to. These transports are, can also be quite stressful for the animals that are being transported, um, especially when they're actually on the vehicles. And again, I'll just point to that picture. To me, that looks quite chaotic. It's probably organized chaos, but it's, you know, it's nighttime. These animals, again, are all being piled up um, next to other animals that they probably are not familiar with, with unfamiliar people. They're going to go on an airplane that they probably have never been on before. And if any of you have anxiety flying, I can imagine the animal who has no idea what this is all about may be feeling the exact same way. There's also um, legal regulations that I'll go into a little bit uh, later in the talk that you need to be aware of and to follow. 
and there's public health concerns to think about when you're organizing your transport programs. And there are some guidelines out there that have been put together by animal welfare organizations, um, but it's interesting if you read through them, they don't always agree as to how to set it up and you know, how to handle the animals. So that can be a little confusing if you're looking at one and then the other one says don't do this and that one says do that. Um, there should be veterinary support for these transport programs, but often uh, it's not taken advantage of or it's not available to the uh, shelters who are trying to participate in these programs. And then you also have to think about um, who's responsible for these animals at which point in time in the transport. So at what point in time do these animals legally stop being the source shelter's responsibility and now they're the destination shelter's responsibility? And I'll just give you an example that to think about like what happens if an animal gets injured on the transport vehicle or that it gets lost? What if it gets delivered to a different shelter than it was supposed to? Who is responsible for paying for that animal to get to where it needs to be or to get treated? So those are all things you want to think about and clarify ahead of time um, when you're forming your partnerships. And then lastly, you really want to think about will participating in a transport program actually be helpful to both the source and the destination shelter. So hopefully um, you know, you'll be able to determine that as we go through our talk here today. So starting with infectious diseases, you guys need to realize that it's, it's very possible that an animal could have an infectious disease and not be showing any symptoms at all. And so any of these animals that we, you um, send off from your source shelter or receive as a destination shelter may look perfectly happy, but uh, healthy but, um, and happy, but they um, might be infected with a disease and they could even be shedding the disease because there are some pathogens that they start shedding before they show uh, clinical symptoms of the disease. So that can be scary because that is a good method for that to spread throughout your shelter if you don't have a plan in place on where to, uh, how to house these animals and protocols to prevent spread of infectious disease um, with your like cleaning and disinfection and handling of these animals. And once an animal gets sick, even if it's just one, but especially if you end up with an outbreak of something that you weren't expecting, that can be quite expensive and time consuming to treat, very stressful on the shelter staff. And of course, a sick animal is not a healthy, happy animal. So any illness that an animal contracts is negatively affecting the welfare of that animal. And then you may even be introducing new pathogens to your community, so like, so outside of your shelter. So if you, you know, bring in animals and they're sick, they infect, um, they're, they're sick in your shelter, and then they can actually go out into the shelter and spread these diseases further. Um, this map I realize is blurry, but it is um, a, <clears throat> a prevalence map for heartworm uh, disease in the United States. It was from last year. And anything that is not orange I, um, it, or red is, is an area that has 2% or less prevalence of heartworm disease. So the point of this is to show that most of the United States still does not have a whole lot of heartworm disease. But we could be changing that with transport programs because we could either intentionally or unintentionally be bringing heartworm positive dogs to areas uh, of low prevalence, which over time could um, increase that to, so that it looks more like the southeast. So we said that transport is stressful to animals, and so there's groups that you really want to think about as the source shelter making available for transport, but also the destination shelter too. You don't want to forget about this as you're selecting animals, that they're, these groups may be more susceptible to stress. So singleton puppies and kittens, they usually um, are socially stressed. So you may want to pair them up with a litter that roughly matches their age if possible. Nursing moms with litters, especially if the litters are less than eight weeks of age, that can be quite stressful to that group of animals as well. Near-term pregnant animals, um, any animal that is injured, it could be painful for them to sit on these transport vehicles because some of them, you know, if it's just a few minutes from one shelter to the other, if you're in close proximity, that may not be a big deal. But if the animal has to sit on the transport vehicle for hours, that could be quite uncomfortable for them, which would be true for any arthritic animal as well. And then anxious animals that may be too much for them mentally to be um, on a transport vehicle for a long period of time. And then aggressive animals, that's something to think about too. 
you, you know, most shelters are not gonna select aggressive animals, but um, what could happen on a transport vehicle is that aggressive animal could be barking, or if it's a cat, snarling at all the other animals around them and bringing everybody's stress level way up. And seniors are another group, not necessarily for infectious disease potential, but they certainly could be have, they could have some systemic disease that's not apparent on physical examination that could really stress them and uh, put them over the edge uh, if they were to be transported. So um, here's an example, a couple examples of transport vehicles. Um, you know, it can happen by plane, by large van, um, sometimes indiv individual personal cars can transport vehicles. Um, and what I really wanted to point out was the van. That's not the, um, the same van as th that's pictured above it. But that is um, packed with crates that are all stacked on top of one another. And I counted 21 that we can see. So who knows how many are ahead of that. But this is something to be aware of that there are um, uh, guidelines and regulations that the transport vehicles uh, operators should be following. They're supposed to be providing rest periods and walkthroughs every four to six hours for the animals that they're transporting. And the problem with that van, the way it's set up, is that um, one, uh, you know, like if an animal were to have urinated at the top or had diarrhea, it could certainly run down and um, expose all the animals below it. But once those van doors are closed, the airflow to, the, to those animals is probably significantly reduced. And then if they, well, if they are supposed, to, they are supposed to be looking at these animals. So if they stopped, there's no aisle way to get to the animals that are further back. Um, and if they had an emergency, how would they reach the animals that we can't see? So you really want to make sure you're working with a reputable group that's following um, the, the rules that they should be. So legal regulations. Um, so if there is interstate travel, so between states, usually those states are going to require health certificates that need to be signed by an accredited, a state accredited veterinarian. So not every veterinarian that's practicing is state accredited. So you want to make sure that you know if that's the case for your state and then ask the veterinarian who's doing the health certificates to make sure that they're accredited. As far as rabies go, um, we of course need to have animals vaccinated with uh, rabies certificates, but the age of vaccination and how frequently it is required varies by state and sometimes by county within the state. And then there are certain health conditions that um, some states will not let you bring in. So uh, as an example, heartworm disease in New York State, um, known heartworm disease, it, it's against the law to import an, a dog that um, has known heartworm disease. And I say known because if it's not tested at the source shelter, it, but it has heartworm disease, you wouldn't know it. You could, you could bring it in um, to New York State and, and that would be okay. Um, some states also require quarantine periods. Massachusetts and Maine are examples of that. And then, so you really need to familiarize yourself with all your local, state, and federal laws, and they absolutely have to be followed if you're working with transport programs. And then there is um, a website, um, a, uh, it's, we refer to it as APHIS, that lists all the um, laws and regulations by state that you can refer to. So regarding public health, this should really be, um, in addition to animal health and safety, public health and safety should be your number one priority when you're thinking about transports. Um, because of course we are lucky here in the United States, we don't have a high prevalence of rabies, but we always wanna think about that there is potential to accidentally bring rabies into our shelter, into our community. So that's important that we, you know, every animal is examined, every um, animal that is, is vaccinated if it's old enough with a proper uh, rabies certificate. And then there's certain parasites that are zoonotic that you'd wanna um, be familiar with and hopefully not bring into your shelter. I always think about like ringworm is a good one to think about. And aggressive animals should be considered a public health risk as well. So you really want to make sure that you're avoiding bringing in both aggressive um, dogs and cats are a little bit more tricky to think about, but um, that's something uh, just to consider. So all these things we worry about, 
but I want to let you know that certainly transport programs can be successful um, if we utilize, well, first of all, if we understand both the needs and the challenges that both shelters are facing, the source shelter and the destination shelter. And what's extremely important is for these shelters to be working with a veterinarian so that that veterinarian can help develop protocols to minimize the spread of infectious disease as well as ensure overall health and then always be helping the shelter to promote continual move through the shelter so that these animals get adopted as quickly as possible. So I have some example guidelines that I want to uh, share with you guys. Um, as far as understanding source shelters, um, you want to think about whether you are the source shelter yourself. You want to think about what challenges are you facing, but the destination shelter could also, should also be familiar with what the source uh, shelter is, uh, what challenges they're facing as well. And have there been any initiatives put into place to help resolve that problem? Because what we don't want to have happen is that this just becomes a cycle over and over and over again. We just, you don't, if you're the destination shelter, you don't want to be the one that has to save the source animal shelters every single time. That uh, shelter and that community should be working towards reducing um, pet overpopulation and whatever problems are contributing to that. So uh, um, you want to look at your own intake practices and see is there anything there that you can do to help um, the reduce infectious disease and, um, and move animals out of the shelter in a different capacity. The destination shelters should try to familiarize themselves too so that they have confidence that the source shelter is you know, doing whatever they can to reduce spread of infectious disease. Do, what do they do with their sick animals? Um, do they have an isolation area? Could one be created to help pr uh, protect the general population? And do they have the capability to process the animals that are going to be um, designated for transport? Because you guys have probably realized it's a bit more, it's, a, it's quite a project. It's more than I think most people realize when they get uh, going with that. So it takes a lot of people and a lot of preparation and supplies to get these animals ready. So that's an important question. Can the source shelter have these animals ready when they're supposed to be? And then will the source shelter be open to feedback and suggestions, either from the destination shelter or other resources? So you as a destination shelter, you know, you may be able to see something that they can't, that they could be working towards. And are they going to be insulted or, you know, completely cut you off if you have a suggestion that may be helpful to them? Hopefully not. <laughs> And then for understanding destination shelters, again, as a destination shelter, make sure you're looking at your own intake protocols, your own um, you know, intake rates, um, and, and make sure you ask yourselves, why are you looking to um, participate with transport programs? Again, it seems obvious it's probably because we don't have whatever um, species and age groups we're trying to pull in. Um, but that's something that the uh, source shelter would want to know as well. You know, why are you looking to um, have animals brought into their shelter? What challenges are you facing? Do you have resources available to care for the animals once they arrive? And um, just as importantly, do you have the means to get them adopted? Because what you don't want to do is bring these animals in and then have the animals sit in your shelter. And then um, for the destination shelters, do they ever euthanize for space? Because if that's the case, they probably shouldn't be participating in the transport at this time. So make sure you guys are a good match for each other and realize that transport is not right for every shelter. Um, maybe it's just at this point in time. You can always you know, work towards that as a goal, but um, it's OK if you decide this is not for you. Um, but there are definitely some benefits of participating. Um, but as far as going back to example guidelines for the source shelter, it's a good idea, just like we recommend with all shelters for your general population, so not just your transport animals, but make sure you're examining your animals um, by trained medical staff at intake. You want to vaccinate and deworm at intake and heartworm test dogs that are six months of age and older. Um, at if you have the ability to do that. But for sure, the exam and vaccination and deworm are a must for the intake shelter because that just shows that they know to protect their general population. As far as testing of cats um, it, with the leukemia and FIV testing, that um, there is some change of thought as to whether you really need to do that for every single cat that comes into your shelter. We usually say, like, if it's going to, the results are going to impact what you do with that animal then testing is probably a good idea. So maybe 
you, for your shelter, that may not make a difference. You may not regularly, if you're the source shelter, test, but maybe your partner destination shelter, if they were to get in an FIV positive cat, they don't have the ability to adopt it out, or a leukemia um, positive cat, they use group housing, they may not want that. So th maybe that group for, that's gonna be transported, you go forward with testing for that. And of course, then administering your preventives, which are flea tick and heartworm, woods lamping every animal to make sure you're protecting against um, ringworm from coming into your shelter as best you can, and behavior evaluations for dogs. So once the source shelter has designated a group to be transported, you, um, and actually just going back to that for a minute, the source shelter, want, you should really make sure that you're very careful about selecting which dogs are available for transport. Um, because you want it to be mutually beneficial. So in other words, you, as a source shelter, you don't want to let all your adoptable, most adoptable dogs go up for transport. You don't want to leave yourself with all the, you know, the black pit bulls. Um, you want to make sure that you still will uh, benefit from this by having a good mix at, in your shelter. You want to make sure that you have your medical records for these animals complete and legible. Uh, there's, I've seen shelters um, with, when they receive transports, they have like, you know, photocopies that are, they might be hard to read, but they might just have a handwritten rabies vaccine given on such and such day. And that's, you know, there's not, that's not legal proof of the rabies being administered. Um, you also want to make sure that these animals have uh, health certificates filled out by veterinarians, accredited veterinarians, if that is what your state requires. And then they should be examined 24 hours, uh, uh, no more than 24 hours prior by a trained medical staff member. And if any uh, abnormal finding is found, that should be communicated to the uh, destination shelter as soon as possible before the animals arrive. For the destination shelter, regarding dog selection, when you are starting to pick your dogs, you really wanna think about like what age, um, would be best suited for your shelter. Can you handle, you know, pediatric patients? Can you, or animals? Um, how about senior animals? They may come with some health problems that require more time to address um, and may uh, lengthen the stay for, for those animals. What breeds would be best for your uh, shelter and for your community as well? What size of animal would work in your shelter if you can't accommodate, you know, a giant breed dog? Of course, don't pick that one. Um, regarding medical conditions, that's something to think about too. Like what does your shelter, if, you're, if there's a dog that has severe dental disease, do you have the capability of addressing that? Um, and if not, then that's something that you would need to know about ahead of time. Or if the animal needed, you know, had a wound that wasn't fully healed and needed addressing, but you don't have um, the ability to do that, that would be a, another example of one you might not want to take also, what behavior conditions can you accept into your shelter? So not every shelter you know, can handle um, anything beyond maybe a jumpy, mouthy dog. That's important for the source shelter to communicate what they f have found and, um, and let you decide if that's something that you can handle. And of course, any animal that you think has um, potential for infectious disease, I'll um, talk about that in just a minute. But this dog selection should be a team approach. It's very important to involve your medical staff and behavior staff if you have that, because as a, uh, managers and administrators, you know you uh, uh, may not be working on the floor and have the um, experience as far as knowing what medical conditions are ones that your shelter can handle. So if you have m any sort of medical staff, even if it's um, you know not. In uh, a licensed veterinary technician, but a, just a staff member who's dedicated to the medical care of the animals, I would definitely get that person's advice and input. And you may even want to consider developing SOPs regarding this, so you could sit down as a team ahead of time and say, this is the age group, this is our minimum age group, this is our maximum age group, these are the breeds we would go with, the, these are the medical conditions we don't want. And then you, after that, once those SOPs are developed, you could then have one point person who is the transport coordinator that could say, okay, they said this and not that, and, you know, and help that person to make decisions. So in general, symptoms that you want to be cautious about would be anything that would be indicative of an infectious disease. And so that would be coughing, runny nose, excessive ocular discharge, diarrhea or vomiting, fever, lethargy, hair loss, because primarily we worry about ringworm, 
Um, and again, anything else that you feel your shelter cannot handle. Again, I'll go back to dental disease as a good example of that. But as far as those infectious diseases, in all honesty, when the health certificate is written, chances are that animal is probably not going to pass for the health certificate. So it's probably, you, you shouldn't hopefully have to worry about this, but it is something to think about if there is no health certificate required. So with, um, from, you know, intrastate um, transport, you may not need a health certificate for that. And so these are things to be on the lookout for. And then groups to just be cautious about typically are the ones that we want the most, the puppies and kittens. And the reason for that is because their immune systems are just not developed um, as, uh, as much as an adult's would be. And so they're the most susceptible group to developing infection. So those are the ones that, I'm not saying don't pick these, but just to be aware that they're the ones that we need to be very cautious with. Um, animals that have no uh, vaccine history prior to entering the shelter, we don't know, do they have immunity to parvo and distemper? So those are a little bit um, worrisome as well. And then again, senior animals because they could be, you know, they could have um, early kidney disease or, or early diabetes, something that is not typically um, apparent on physical exam necessarily. So the destination shelter should come up with a pre-arrival plan. And um, this is where you, know, you get your list of your dogs that are coming in. And if anything makes you uh, nervous, don't be afraid to contact the source shelter ahead of time and request a copy of the medical record so that you can review it. And ideally, you'd do that with a veterinarian to help you make a decision should you bring this animal in or not. You want to prepare your staff and all your supplies ahead of time so that you're ready to go as soon as these animals get here. And start thinking about where you're going to house these animals, um, particularly if you're going to be bringing um, pediatric animals in. You probably, if you have a foster program, you'd want to utilize them for that so that they're not sitting in your shelter and becoming exposed to all the pathogens that the adult dogs could potentially be spreading. And you want to contact those fosters and uh, have them lined up so that they can, they can meet you at the shelter at the time of the transport arrival if possible. Um, for the destination shelter for intake uh, guidelines, so now the dogs are here at your shelter. You as, no matter what time of day they're coming off, I don't know if any of you have had um, them come like really late at night or super early in the morning, you're kind of dependent on the airlines for that. So your regular staff is not going to be present. The, if you're lucky, there's, there should be, hopefully be at least two people who are doing this. But they may not necessarily be trained um, medical staff members. So I'm just thinking of, for instance, at the SPCA of Tompkins County, the executive director, um, he's usually the one who goes with whoever's willing to go with him. And so he doesn't really have the medical knowledge. But I mean, the average person can usually see you know, a runny nose. They can see wounds. So, those people, if they uh, have to unload these animals at an off time when the rest of the staff is not present, they should at least do an a inspection of these animals, lay eyes on them, make sure they write down anything that they think is worrisome, and also let them know, you know, if this animal is coughing, don't put that dog in the general population, put it in isolation. Um, and then within 24 hours of arrival, these animals should be examined by trained medical staff within the shelter. You want to vaccinate them and deworm them according to their need and age, and then perform all testing that your shelter typically does ahead of time, screening testing, including a woods lamp. I would do that, you know, even if the source shelter did their woods lamp, do it again, just as a precaution. Um, you know, do your re the rest of your intake protocols as you normally would, applying preventives. Uh, apply a de identification if they don't already have that on, and then determine where you want those animals to be housed but also remember what is the next step towards getting them adopted. So a lot of times you can determine that ahead of time when you get your list of animals, you can see this one's gonna need to be spayed and neutered. Um, this one is a senior animal, so should, this one's probably gonna need a veterinary exam or you know, a medical exam to, to look that one over and get that going right away so that you minimize the length of stay for these animals. So going back to quarantine, this is a question that um, comes up for both source shelters and destination shelters. And so there's uh, two schools of thought. One um, is for quarantine, one is for not. And I just want to tell you what, what the, what, go into that a little bit better. Um, so the quarantine um, will lengthen this, uh, will increase the length of stay. And the 
worry, worrisome part of that is that that allows animals to potentially be exposed to infectious diseases. So we know for sure that the incidence of diseases in shelters increases as correlated to the number of days that they with, uh, stay within the shelter. So that, that is a problem at both the source and the destination shelter, and probably more the source shelter because, again, that's the shelter that is um, overcrowded. They're looking to get these animals out. They probably have higher disease within their shelter. So we would advise don't, don't have the source shelter quarantine animals. We um, want to get those animals out of that source shelter as quickly as possible. Um, some states, though, require it at the destination point. So again, Maine and Massachusetts, you're going to be forced to do um, a quarantine once they come into your shelter. And as far as the, um, the destination shelter, whether you decide to quarantine those animals or not, um, you could decide that based on was there a known exposure on the transport vehicle. For instance, did a puppy break with Parvo on the transport vehicle and now all the dogs have been exposed, at least within the vicinity of uh, that puppy. So maybe that's a group uh, that you do want to quarantine for. Um, does the source shelter that you're working with have chronic disease that you know every time you work with them they're bringing animals in and they break with disease? If that's the case, if you continue to work with them, then you probably would want to quarantine those animals. And one thing that may work for your shelter is to treat this animal like a little herd of its, uh, sorry, to treat all of the transport uh, animals as a little herd within your shelter and segregate them from the rest of the population if you can do that. Um, this is a, a picture of a few runs and you probably have heard us say this before, but if you don't have a separate room for these animals, um, you can definitely just leave a few runs betw empty between your general population and these tra transport dogs. Or if you have multiple rows of runs, one row can be dedicated to the transport dogs so that ideally they are just kind of contained within that region. You can also uh, create barriers with shower curtains and sheets if you wanted to do that as well, to, which is kind of nice because that gives uh, staff members a physical reminder that this is a different group of animals and we should be cautious with that. But the idea behind that is that you would then move that herd of transport animals through your shelter together as much as possible. So if you happen to get all puppies in, they all need to be spayed and neutered. They all get spayed and neutered on the same day. Then they all get moved to the adoption floor on the same day. This doesn't always work out perfectly because sometimes you have a mix of ages, a mix of needs. And so I w I'm not saying hold animals back just so that they stay with the group. But in general, if you were able to keep them together, it helps to protect the rest of your population if these animals are infected with something and they're just, it's not apparent um, yet because it's early in the uh, incubation time frame. And then you always want to be thinking about how you can prepare for the worst case scenario. Um, I don't want to scare anybody from participating in transports, but you can see there is potential for things to go wrong with transports. And so we can, but we can um, do this successfully if you have really good protocols in place. And so you really want to make sure that your staff is using personal protective equipment when they're handling these animals. Um, definitely gloves. Um, change gloves before handling the next uh, group of animals that come in. This lady, um, you know, has a gown on and you could use a smock that you could change um, or just change your shirt. She has a cap on, you probably don't have to go that far, but maybe you, if you have shoe covers, you might want to do that, especially if these transport dogs have diarrhea, from, even just from parasites, something like that. You want to make sure your staff is using really strict cleaning and disinfection protocols so that, again, no um, infectious pathogens are getting spread via fomites. And then don't forget about daily rounds. This is a, a group that you really want to pay attention to for as long as you have them. Look at them every single day because then if they start to develop symptoms, you can act on it right away and hopefully move them to isolation or if you have to utilize a foster something on that or which also brings um just reminds me to clarify with it between your partners if a euthanasia decision was needed to be made at the destination shelter how is that going to work um, if you had you know some severe problem as a destination shelter that you felt you could not address and it was in the animal's best interest to euthanize it is the source shelter okay with you doing that 
technically they probably should because legally that animal should be yours, but you are in a partnership. So do they do at least do they want to be notified? You know, in some cases I've heard where source shelters will request the animal back. Are you okay? You know, putting the animal through the stress of um, taking it back to the source shelter, and then what happens to it? So those are all co uh, conversations and questions to have with one another. Okay. Um, okay, but what happens if you do all this, you still feel like you, okay, we've done what you're saying, but we're still getting animals in and they're still breaking with disease. And um, as the destination shelter, we think it's the source shelter's fault. Well, the first thing I would say to you is to remember that each uh, infectious pathogen has varying incubation periods. You'll have to consult with a veterinarian or an LVT to help you um, know how long these uh, incubation periods tend to be. But that's important to think about because it helps you to determine, did that animal get sick at the source shelter or did it get sick at your shelter? So if it was, um, you know, like uh, if the animal's been um, in your shelter for several weeks and it breaks with something that has a short incubation period, that didn't come from the source shelter, it came from your shelter. So that's one of the things that can help you determine that. And then if at that point, you really want to review your own shelter and intake protocols and make sure that you're following um, them to uh, as best as you can to help uh, prevent spread of infectious disease. But if you're certain that this has originated from the source shelter, especially if it keeps happening over and over again, you really want to contact your source shelter and in a professional you know, way um, without trying to uh, sound like you're accusing them of doing something terrible. You want to let them know what you're seeing, what's happening. Um, it would be great if you said, you know, our veterinarian also agrees and because it's this incubation period time frame. Um, and then try to work with the source shelter to alleviate that problem. And that may be the time when you consult with a university like the Cornell's um, Shelter Medicine Program to see what ideas they have that you can employ. They may say, okay, it's time to start doing some testing to help us determine do these animals have proper antibodies, you know, um, to protect them from diseases. But then that brings up questions of who will pay for that, you know, what, um, whose responsibility is that to take care of those. And you may have to look at it and say, okay, you know, they're not, they're, they're not willing to work with us and we're not willing to work with them at, at, uh, at this time, and so can this partnership continue? And if you decide that's the case, that's okay to take a, a break and let the source shelter, you know, um, either take your advice and um, get their situation under control or, or uh, just completely separate them so that you can protect your own population. That's absolutely okay to do that. So, in summary, um, transport programs are definitely life-saving programs for animals that are in, um, in risk, but, um, or at risk, but the programs themselves involve risk that you need to be aware of. Remember that public um, and um, animal safety is our number one priority. Don't forget to familiarize yourself with your laws and uh, know them. And then you want to make sure you establish really good working relationships together, so that involves good communication know what the expectations are on both ends, know what the capability is on both ends, and then don't forget to help address the source shelter's challenges that they're facing. Probably, again, I just want to emphasize one of the most important factors is to establish and utilize protocols that are, um, were developed by a veterinarian to help prevent the spread of infectious disease, ensure overall health, and then um, keep those animals moving towards adoption as quickly as possible. So some good resources that are available um, are the ASPCAPro.org uh, has some really good webinars on transport protocols. AVMA.org has an animal travel and transport uh, document and they are doing an update on that, so that's coming out soon. There's SAWA best practices for companion animal transport, and then the USDA APHIS uh, website is another good one to help you learn what your state laws are. All right, well, uh, we'll be up here for a couple minutes if you want to come up directly, but otherwise, thank you so much for staying and uh, li uh, listening through it. <laughs>